Well, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Um, see, real men cry. That's what I'm talking about. There you go. Praise the Lord. You know, in the scripture, when Paul was being sent out um, and they knew they were never going to see him again, they wept bitterly. Uh, that's what love looks like. And that's what real relationship looks like. Amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's word, I want you to open it up to the book of First Samuel. First Samuel. We're taking a little off-road detour. We're going to jump back into the book of Colossians, uh, not too briefly. Uh, we are still in the series, A New Normal. We're looking at the reality of living a new way for the Lord. Uh, we've been looking at family. We've looked at uh, how to live spiritually different. Uh, and last week, we picked off where we left off, really diving in deeper as we talk, talked about marriage. But then we also then talked about uh, men and the reality of how men are called to live. And we're going to do a part two of that. We're going to do a part two of that. And today, we're going to look at the challenge of being a man. The challenge of being a man. Now, if you're a lady in this room, you can identify with this message as well, because many of the things that uh, these men are going to experience in this passage are things we experience as all followers of Jesus and those who follow in the Lord. Uh, but specifically, we're going to be talking to men in this message. If you stand with me one last time, we're going to read 1 Samuel chapter 30, only verses 1 through 6. The word of the Lord says to us, David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag. They also kidnapped the women and everyone in it from the youngest to the oldest. They had killed no one but had carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men arrived at the town, they found it burned. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. David and his troops with him wept loudly until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives, Anohim and, and the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had also been kidnapped. David was in an ex, in extremely difficult position because the troops talked about stoning him. For they all were very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. But we're keying in right here. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Amen. You may be seated. You know, in the movie Forrest Gump, the famous line that Forrest Gump says is, life is like a what? Box of chocolates, right? Yeah. You never know what you're going to get. If you've actually experienced those chocolate boxes that Forrest Gump is talking about, you know exactly what he means. Those boxes are full with good tasting chocolate and then the weirdest tasting chocolate you could ever feast your eyes on. Like who in the world puts like cherry and other goo inside of chocolate? You just never know, right? You pop those things in your mouth and then what do you get? You never know. It's like a surprise. Life happens to us that way as well. You wake up one morning, you're feeling great. The next morning, you're riddled with cancer. One morning, life is going good at your job. The next morning, they're downsizing. We just never know what life will throw at us. It's a mix of both good and bad. But the picture is this. It's not necessarily what life throws at you, but it's how you are going to respond to the things life throws at you. It's how you're going to respond in the midst of the turmoil that you are facing. In fact, for some, to taste bitterness in life through trials and sufferings and hardship, it leaves them as a people who are looking to blame everyone for their problems instead of asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that you're teaching me? What is it that you want to do through my life in this moment? The truth is, even the godliest of us face hardships and unexpected pitfalls in life. But the difference for those who know the Lord is that we trust Christ through it all. Understand this, godly men face the bitterness of life in the strength of the Lord and remain hopeful in his delivering power. That's the main point that we're looking at even in this story. Godly men were facing the hardship of life. And instead of being bitter, they have to find strength in the Lord. This is what true biblical manhood is all about. 
In fact, 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23 says it this way, For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult or return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Notice that is the reality for the Christian. When we face hardships, when we face adversity, when we face the things in life that come out of nowhere, we trust in the Lord. We trust that because how Christ suffered, how he went through hardship, we walk through it the same way. So when someone does us wrong, we don't retaliate as the world does. When things happen in our lives that are not uh, the best things that we could have ever thought, we turn to the Lord. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that, look, his goal was to know the Lord in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. When we engage in suffering and hardships in life, God calls us to trust in his power, in his might. So Paul desired to know him intimately through his suffering. Why? Because sufferings conform us to the image of Jesus. And for godly men, when we walk through sufferings, it conforms us to look more like the Savior. So when life drains us, when we're feeling empty, we go to the Lord. However, many men today live on empty, and they're wondering where to turn. Well, Christ calls you to turn to him. He calls you to turn to him in the midst of whatever struggle you find yourself in. Why? If you're a godly man, godly men will face loss at times. Godly men will face loss at times. We've heard the phrase, taking the L. You ever heard that before? Well, that's the new Fandango way of saying, look, you're facing life and you you lost. I don't know any person that likes to lose, especially if you're a competitive person. You ever played a game with a competitive person? They're the worst to play with, right? You're playing Monopoly, and if they're losing, they'll toss the whole table over. No one likes to lose. We all like to win. But the reality is, life is set up at times for you to lose. Just play spades a little bit. You're going to be like, oh, man, like, I never play. Don't, don't play with me. I'm a horrible player. Today's text, we find the story of King David, the king of Israel. And the man the Bible calls a man after God's own heart. Now, this is something we have to hold on to. You have to remember what the scripture says about David. He is a man after God's own heart. This is going to help us to understand why David responded in the way that he did. When life actually presses upon people who are after God's own heart, they respond differently. The greatest coaches, in fact, aren't those who berate their players, but those who push them to condition, to press through when things get hard and things get difficult. And this is how God is with us. He presses us to look more like Christ. Now understand, before David became king, the scripture tells us that the man who was after God's own heart, as a young man, killed a giant. He killed a giant in the strength of the Lord. He was anointed. He was set apart as a new king And even when the current king was in place, King Saul, David was called to lead as God had set him apart to do. Now, think about this. As a man, this is the dream, to have everything you touch and everything you do to work. Your money works. Your body works. The the, the relationship you're in, it works. You have favor on your job. You have favor with your friends. This is the dream. To live in a manner that you are always on top. I'm winning. For some men, this doesn't necessarily mean you have all the riches in the world, but it means not only do you have what you need, but you're you're advancing with the, the dreams and the visions that you have. You're on top of the world. And this is where David found himself. Not in a bad way, but in a very good way. Remember, David... Jewish man set apart for God's use, set apart as a king, was after God's own heart. 
It was a man who killed the great champion Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, the mortal enemies of the Jewish people. David now, by the time we get to chapter 30, finds himself embedded with the enemies of Israel. David had to find refuge among them. Why? Well, because God had anointed David as king, Saul had David as in his court uh, serving him. Saul begins to lose his mind, and he begins to say, David not only wants my kingdom, but wants to kill me, so now I'm going to kill David instead. And David is now on the run. Isn't that how life happens sometimes? Everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, life just shifts on you. The job is going well. Things are happening, and then all of a sudden, it changes. The goals that you were working towards, all of a sudden, now are no longer advancing. You lose your career. You thought these habits that you had breaking, broken free from now seem to be encroaching on your life again, and now you seemingly seem to be taking the proverbial L. David, though, was a man, a godly man who was rejected by Saul. And now David was made out to be an enemy of the, of the people of Israel. Saul misjudged David, and this is not who David was. But so did the king of the Philistines as well, King Achish, who wanted to turn David into his friend. And therefore turn him into an enemy against Israel and therefore the God whom he served. How do we know this? 1 Samuel 29 and 3, when, it, when the Philistines were now going up in a battle against the Israelites, David finds himself in the middle. David was a faithful man. He found refuge among the Philistines. In verse 29, in chapter 29, verse 3, it says this, From the day he defected until today... This is what King Achish said about him. I found no fault with him. Now, what he wanted to see happen was that he wanted to see David along with his men to come and fight the battle with them. But David was in a precarious place. But in God's providence, the Philistines would not allow David to fight with them in the battle. And this was indeed the Lord protecting David from being seen as an enemy of Israel. God had set him up to be the next king, and this was going to come to pass, even though David found himself in this situation. So the story goes, before we get to chapter 30, David and his 600 men are sent home. They're sent home. They tell them, look, we don't need you. Go about your way. Although I know you found refuge among us, we're no longer in need of your services. So go back home to where you came from. Now keep in mind, this is David and this is 600 men who is sent home from the battle lines. But after a long journey home, they come upon a sight they did not imagine. They left all their family back in camp. They left the camp, went all the way to the front lines, and said, hey, look, we're going to do what we need to do to keep our families protected, to keep ourselves safe. But when they travel back home, what does it say in chapter 30? David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Gab and attacked and burned Ziklag. They also had kidnapped the women and everyone in it, from the youngest to the oldest. They had killed no one, but had carried them off as they went on their way. Now the Amalekites, they were enemies of Israel as well. And the Amalekites had given trouble to the Israelites for a very long time. In fact, the Lord actually told King Saul, the king was at the, the king at the time, he told them to destroy them. But as David and his men were away, they come back home instead to find everything gone. They went to fight one enemy, but on the back end, the other enemy came and raided their camp. Ask yourself, have you ever been that helpless before? Well, you come upon something and there's nothing you can do. You're at the place asking, asking the Lord, Lord, what in the world just happened? In fact, 
Today, many men are taught when they face a situation like this to show no emotion. To not even engage with what's happening around them. In fact, the only emotion men are taught to express is anger. And that true manhood does not express emotion but holds it all in. Yet the secret of many men is that they quietly suffer with loss, disappointment, and feelings of failure secretly. There are men who are secretly depressed, but they don't show it. They just grin and bear it. You're like, man, why you got high blood pressure? I don't know. It's probably not because of all the salty food you eat either. Probably because you don't sleep at night. It could be because you're carrying all the weight of what seems to be the world while everybody else is skipping through the tulips and singing la, la, la. While you're laboring and be laboring to do and care for your family, you're taking loss after loss, and you're just holding it all in. And this is where David and his men found themselves. They found themselves attacked by the enemy, facing immediate loss and hopelessness. I want you to understand this if you're a man this morning. Tears are not an automatic disqualification of manhood. And expressing feelings of sorrow, disappointment, or confusion is not a demotion of your manhood. Godly men don't suck it up or get over it, but instead face their problems with courage and wisdom and cast all their cares on the Lord who cares for them. That is the difference. If a godly man faces a problem, it doesn't crush them, but at the same token, they don't act like a robot either. They recognize the reality of the situation before them, and they deal with the emotions that they have, but then guess what? They encourage themselves in the Lord as we're going to see what David did. Again, God was not taken by the surprise that happened to David and his men. In fact, God is not taken by surprise by the losses in our lives. A diagnosis of prostate cancer. The thing you used to be able to do and the the way you could engage with your spouse, now you no longer can do that and it affects your manhood. The child you poured into that has now gone astray. The wife and it's talking about men. The wife that not only denies you the deepest need that you have, and you go without, but treats you disrespectfully in your own home. And the worst is if you're a godly man, and you have a so-called godly wife, but she acts godly on Sunday and acts like a demon Monday through Saturday. And you're seeking to serve Jesus, and yet it's seeming that they're not. But yet as a man, you keep taking the L, you keep taking the L, and you stuff it in, you stuff it in, you stuff it in, you stuff it in. Psalm 139, 1 through 2 says this, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. If you're a man and you're sitting there, you're listening to this, and you're saying, look, nobody knows what I'm going through, and I can't share this with any other man. I can't share this with anybody else because they won't understand. Understand this. The Lord knows, and the Lord understands. And the Lord calls you to actually pour out your heart to him and pour out your life to him because he understands the struggle that you're going through. God knows the way we go and is sovereignly orchestrating our days for his glory. And so we must rest that God is indeed in control and knows the way we should take and the way we should go even when we don't. Even when we face a situation like David and his men are facing where everything is seemingly taken away and now we don't know what to do. We're at the bottom of the proverbial barrel. We have to know God knows the way. The Bible says in Isaiah 45, 7, 
I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. That is the Lord. The Lord knows when you're taking a loss, and the Lord knows how he's going to bring you through that. God knows and orchestrates your steps and can orchestrate your life. So give your whole self over to him. As a man, you have to say, Lord, you know exactly where I am, and I trust you to keep me, but also lead me to where I need to go. Why? Because godly men respond to adversity in the strength of the Lord. Now, you may say, Pastor, you're going two weeks and you're talking to men. I guarantee you, if I did five weeks on women this, women that, you praise the Lord. No, we need this. Godly men respond to adversity in the strength of the Lord. Look what the Bible says. Again, looking at the reality, when David and his men, verse 3, arrived at the town, they found it burned. The town, they found it. Their, their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. David and his troops with him wept build, loudly until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives were gone. Verse 6, David was in an extremely difficult position because the troops talked about stoning him. Now remember, this was 600 mighty warriors. These were not weak men. These are the same men the Bible talks about that would go and burst through a troop to bring back water to David. These are not weak men. Christianity is not a weak man's dis disposition faith. Because it's always going to build you up and encourage you to be as the full magnitude of manliness as you can be. Now, don't listen to these folks that are telling you. I just saw somebody send me a video. Um, the, yes, this morning. It was this morning. Sent me a video of a guy who was preaching. I guess he was speaking at a church. And he's supposed to be like one of those guys who's like, you know, super fit. And he looks super good. And he has like the, the cool clothes on. And he was using God's name as a curse word and like using other four-letter words and he was telling men how to be men. Men don't learn from fools. So if you're a man and been listening to foolish people that are telling you to do foolish things in the guise of being manly, you are just as foolish. True biblical men listen to men who are walking in wisdom, and that wisdom comes from Christ. Again, we see these were 600 mighty men, yet the, even the strongest of men can get cut at the knees by the troubles of life. Why? Look at what the scripture says. David and the troops with him wept bitter loudly or bitterly until they had no strength left to weep. Think with me for a moment. These were battle-ready men. First, they were denied the fight. They were told to head back home. The journey home was three days with all their equipment, all the things they had to do. And I'm sure for most of those men, if they had been gone for a while, all their mind was definitely the one track. I can't wait to get home. Can't wait to see my spouse. Can't wait to be with my family. But what did they find? They were tired. They were ready to see their families, and yet they find one of the greatest calamities in their life. Today, we have a crisis of manhood in our culture in the ch and in the church. And it's an epidemic of either hyper-masculinity, devoid of character, and Christ, or it's the rejection of manhood that rises to the occasion and faces life challenges. We don't have to go to one ditch or the other. We can just stay right with Jesus. We can be biblical men that really love Jesus and have compassion for others. The question for each one of us, though, whether you're a man or a woman, as a Christian, how do you respond when you are drained by life? More specifically... As a man today, has life drained you where instead of pressing on, you have simply stopped? You've given up. No one else knows you've given up, but internally you know you've given up. You just stop trying. The drive and the ambition, all these things have ceased in your life. And the question could be asked, well, should men have ambition if they're godly? You sure better have ambition. Drive. 
ambition to glorify God and to say, God, if I'm a turnip, I want you to squeeze every bit of whatever's in me out for your glory. That means I'm going to live and strive to live in such a way where mediocrity is not anything someone can say ever about my life. How I think, how I dress, how I walk, the things that I do, that I'm doing this to the glory of God and to the, my, the best of my ability. So, notice David and his men were overwhelmed with grief, so undone that their wives, children had been taken away by an enemy who they had the responsibility to protect them from. Now think these men were out doing what was right, and seemingly trouble came knocking on their back door. See, sometimes in life, you cannot avoid trouble, even when you're doing the right thing. Even when you're doing the godly thing, you cannot avoid suffering because life happens to us all. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Notice, they wept to the point until their strength was gone. You ever cried that way before? Well, you just cried and cried. There's no more tears left. There's no more cry. There's no more tears left. And you are just left at the end of yourself. The Israelite soldiers grieved, especially over the loss of their sons and daughters, according to verse 6. As they speculated about their abuse and the pain their children would have to face at the hand of the Amalekites. But look what happened, though. These men wept and couldn't weep anymore. Their strength was gone. They couldn't do anything. And the Bible tells us that they became bitter in spirit. Men are called to love with a deep compassion of their homes. Not only defending them physically, but spiritually and emotionally. I want you to understand. While this could be very much blanket, right? Yes, moms do weep over their children. But dads weep over their kids as well. A real man does not want their children, especially if they're a godly man, to be taken away by Satan, to be taken away by the world, and not follow Jesus. The one thing that will break a godly man is their children. It will cause them to weep in a, in a passionate way to say, Lord God, I don't want to see my children to go away from you. The man whose ex won't let him see his children and put doubt in their children's minds that their father doesn't love them is a man who will weep for his children. There are many men in this world who they don't want to just pay child support. They want to actually be active and be there in their children's life. But there are wicked women who actually come against this and push the father away. I'm talking about godly men. I'm talking about men who actually want this. And yes, the opposite is true. There are many deadbeats. We ain't talking about them. We're talking about the man who actually wants to be there. The man that actually desires a relationship with his children, but yet has been denied. Understand. The man who has a son in the home who refuses to heed to their instruction brings a real man to his knees and pools of tears in their eyes. Now look what happened with these men. They became so angry that bitterness welled up in their hearts. Verse 6 tells us that they were bitter at David over the loss of their sons and daughters. Now bitterness is a disposition of the heart And one the Bible actually tells us to put away because of where it could lead our lives. See, when we're wrong by life, it can lead us to being bitter, to have resentment, or that's what it is. Bitterness, all it is, it's it's unresolved hate and emotions that you didn't do anything with. And bitterness leads you that way. Think about those who wronged you, or you think about what happened to you, the decisions you made in life, or the decision that was forced on you. Understand, ask yourself the question, are you walking in more bitterness and resentment than you are in love? Maybe you're bitter towards yourself. Maybe you're bitter towards your father or your mother, whoever. But understand this truth. 
A bitter man is a negative man, and one whose disposition is easily moved to anger over the position in life. Bitter men make horrible workers, because bitter men always find the negative in everything. And bitter men are those who live with a short fuse and go off on everybody. Bitter men are those whose emotions have been stunted instead of dealt with. In today's culture, we need the opposite of that. And notice the progression of David's men. They move from sorrow, bitter, and now to anger. Because somebody's got to take blame for what's wrong in my life, right? So David is not only at a loss with his family being taken away, but now he's about to lose his life. And how do we respond as men? How do we respond even as Christians when the pressure of life wants you to become bitter and angry instead of Jesus-centered? You say, oh, pastor, in no way we, we, we could be bitter. Well, let's look at what the scripture says, Ephesians 4.32. The verses before that says, put off, take off, no longer walk in bitterness, but instead do this, and be kind. And compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Again, in our culture today, we need men who would not buckle under the pressure of life, but instead stand firm in their faith in Jesus Christ. That they will be beacons of hope and truth in a world full of pessimistic men. You ever been around a person that's just pessimistic, pessimistic all the time? You don't like hanging around that person. You love them, but you're like, man, I hate when you talk. Ooh. <laughs> you can be like, I got this vision. I got the capital, and then we're going to make this happen. Man, you don't know how the economy is today. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, man. You know the man out there, the man. It's the man. Man, I ain't worried about the man. I'm the man right now. And what I'm saying is, this is where we're going. No, you can't go that way. <laughs> Bitter people live with no vision and no ambition in their life. But we see David, remember, David found hope in the Lord. They, he found hope in the God who saves Remember, David is a man after God's own heart. And what does he say in verse 6? But David, this is opposite of the men, but David found strength in the Lord, his God. This is what it means to truly lead as a man. When everyone else around you is not only Debbie Downer, but Don the Downer or whatever, and they're walking in all this, and they're walking in the pity, they're walking in pessimism, I'm going to find my strength in the Lord. Yeah, I'm knocked out just as you are, but instead, my strength comes from Yahweh. Understand, this wasn't David mustering up some strength from some place that he didn't know he had. No, this wasn't him picking up himself by his bootstraps. This wasn't a man who's just saying, well, I'm just going to suck it up. No, this was a humble confidence in the God who, through him, killed the lion and the bear and the giant. This was a man who says, Oh, I may be in a position where I'm, I'm facing this, but I'm not going to forget who my God is. And the God whom I serve. Psalm 34, 3 through 4 says this, Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. And look at this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. That is how the godly man responds. That the Lord can rescue me from all my fears. This could also be read saying in, in verse uh, 6 in 1 Samuel, where David found strength in the Lord, David was strengthened by the Lord. Or saw co consolation and strength in prayer, believing confidence in the Lord. And this is a sharp distinction between Saul, the current king, and the incoming king. Instead, David waited on the Lord. And the Lord renewed his strength. Why? Because Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Men, here's a question for you. When was the last time you boasted in your weakness? 
but in God's strength. See, here's the thing. Maybe you're in the financial pickle you're in so that God can show you, one, money is not your God, I am. Maybe it's so hard for you if you're a single man to find a godly woman is because you keep trying to operate in human wisdom instead of godly wisdom. And God is saying, I'm not sending nobody your way till you get yourself together. Understand, we boast in Jesus because the godly man turns to Jesus Christ who carries us in our weaknesses, who bore our shame in weakness. It's hard to say the Lord's grace is sufficient if we're constantly relying on our own strength. But David finds strength in the Lord, and guess what? He continues to run on, and we follow. David just really is showing us the same thing that Jesus showed us, and we're following Christ's example. How do we know? Hebrews 12, 2, it says this, Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he would endure the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is who we follow. That is who we trust in. The one who has endured all things and we find strength in the Lord. That is where our strength comes from. Not in ourselves. And how do we know this? Look at the last thing we're going to look at. Godly men rise up and face the enemy in the strength of the Lord. I love this where it says, David said to the priest, he says, look, bring me the ephod. So he brought it to him. And David asked the Lord, should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? This is the exact opposite of what the current king did. The current king, he went to and went and sought after an actual witch, an actual medium, an actual sorcerer. But David says, no, nah, we don't need all that. We're going we're to follow the Lord who is mighty and strong in battle, who is our great God. And he says, look, David per- consulted the Lord. And the Lord responded to him in verse number seven, pursue them, for you will certainly overtake them and rescue the people. We see this progression of encountering the problem, weeping over a problem. But then guess what? You actually have to face the problem. The evidence that David found strength in the Lord is that he faced the situation head on. He looked to the Lord and moved forward. He acts with a linen ephod. And this was a special article of clothing to help determine the will of God. David, before he even made a move, before he did anything, he sought the Lord. David didn't want to make a move until he sought what God had to say. Now, we look at the big picture. God was about to use David to replace Saul, the current king who refused to eliminate the Amalekites, whom he judged, but the Lord gives David this assurance. The Lord replied to him, pursue them, for you will certainly overtake them and rescue the people. Now think of this. During this great time of distress, both Saul and David sought supernatural guidance. It could be they were seeking God on, uh, seeking all these things on the same day. could be, I don't know, but David and his 600 men, though, were empowered by God Almighty. These same 600 men who were worn out from travel, worn out of distress, said it's time to go to war. It's time to muster ourselves up in the courage of the Lord and go and do what God has called us to do. The Bible tells us when he catches up with them, he finds an Egyptian slave who the Amalekites leave by the roadside. And instead of killing him, David shows him compassion. But in this process, David loses 200 of the 600 men. They were simply worn out, but yet with a small band of men, the Bible tells us that David overtakes the Amalekites and takes back all that was taken from them. Men, if you're looking around and waiting for the worn out and torn down to stand up and do what's right, you're going to be waiting for a minute. God may be calling you as the man to say, no, Lord, I'm not looking at those who have fallen by the wayside. I'm actually going to just stand firm in you. With a small band of brothers, can I I share something with you men? And I share this in love. Some men in this room and could be listening to this, maybe you're waiting for your father, 
your grandfather, your uncles who you've always sought after the affirmation from, but they're like these men. They're, they're by the roadside. They're, they've given up. They've thrown in the towel. They're not even trying or, or doing anything. You're waiting for them. Maybe once my father affirms me, maybe once my father or my mother tells me how proud of they am of me and how much they love me and how much they're glad to see that I'm a man, stop waiting for it. The truth is, you may never get it. You're like, oh man, Pastor, you're supposed to say the opposite. Pray. Ask the Lord for his help. Ask the Lord to intervene. But you may never get that. But just because you don't get it doesn't mean you have to live with a deficit. You can find strength in the Lord. And just as David banded together with these other men, you can band together with other men as well. And maybe, guess what? You may never have your father tell you, I'm proud of you and I see you as a man. But you could have somebody else in your life say that. And are you thankful for that, though? This is what God calls us to. You see, David in his despair trust and turn to the Lord that whenever a crisis comes we need the courage to face it and we must not try to blame others or pretend that nothing is wrong I spent so long in my young adult life blaming people because of my certain situation and instead of just saying Lord this is the lot that I find myself in God, I do have this deficit, but Lord Jesus, I need the wisdom to overcome it. I live in much bitterness. But bitterness never leads to joy. It only leads to despair. And it continues to show you over and over again that guess what? Not only are you not enough, but the reality of what you face in your life is so overwhelming you can't overcome it. So now your eyes are blinded to the God who is greater than your problem. But it wasn't until I had to say to the Lord, Lord, you know what? I, I don't want to walk in despair anymore. The thing I desire the most, God, you know what? I don't need that because the thing I desire the most, I actually have. Being told that I'm a son of the king. Being told by the Lord that he is proud of me every single day. Being told by the Lord that, guess what? Your your financial position does not determine your manhood. I do. When David was in despair, he turned to the Lord. When he faced crisis, he turned to the Lord. And he trusted God to give him wisdom to know what to do and the strength to do it. When we step out on faith and trust the Lord, he'll guide us. He'll lead us. And God gave David and his men the strength they needed to defeat the enemy and recover all the things that was lost. Psalm 37 and 5 says this, commit your way to the Lord Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So if you're a man sitting there today, are you trusting in the Lord with the whole being of your life? Are you steadily living in bitterness and brokenness instead of being healed by the Lord who desires to heal you? But even if you're not a man today, maybe you're sitting there and you know that the bitterness that you're living in is not bringing your life any joy or any peace, but you can find peace in Jesus Christ. The one who took the bitter cup on our behalf and says, you no longer have to drink of the bitterness. You no longer have to drink of the hate. I hate to say it, there's men whose fathers have died and they live daily to hate that person. And you keep trying not to be like this person. I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to do this. And you, you live, instead of living for God's glory, you live for your dad's glory. So everything you do on your job, in, in your marriage, that's what drives you. That's what drives your thoughts. That's what drives your heart. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like that. And then one day you talk and you're like, dang, I sound just like my dad. You laugh, you laugh, just like your dad. You look in the mirror, and then you begin to hate yourself. 
that's not how God called you to live. You live for God's glory alone. God knows the deficits you have. And God can use you despite the deficit. Because God loves you despite your inadequacy. So guess what you got to do? Bring all your inadequacies to the Lord. And say, Jesus loves me. He loves me. And he's thankful that I'm a man. Because it's good to be a man. Men, you are not a poser. Because there are many men who are 45 who still feel like they're 12. That's the secret hard thing about being a man. You get around other confident men, you're like, man, I don't feel like I measure up. To be a man does not mean you have to like sports and know everything about the NFL, can fix, uh, you know, carburetors and all that. You may not know how to do any of that. And because you didn't like those things growing up, people told you, you're not really a man. Maybe you make enough money to go actually pay somebody to fix your carburetor. Being a man is both biological, right? No one can take that away from you. But it's also the reality of how you walk, how you live, how you think, how you, how you walk and carry yourself. If no one has ever told you as a man they're proud of you, let the Lord do it. But if you need another man to tell you that, come, come up here. I'll, t- I'll tell you. I'll tell you I love you. I tell God I love him all the time. Man, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're doing a good job. Some men live with that deficit because you never had another man tell you, bro, this my boy right here. Come here, Brandon. Come here. I have to do it to you, bro. Come on. I'm not going to bash you, I promise. This is one of my sons. I love this boy. Now, this is my son, though. You, you get what I'm saying? He's different than me. He does. He's like, there's nothing. This is my boy. Let me tell you something. Some men, some men don't know what it's like for a man who is their father or another man in their life to stand before a crowd and say, boy, this is mine. I know there are men in here where you're broken because there's never been a man to affirm you to say you can get up and go. And there's men in their 40s, there's men in their 30s who are facing situations and they don't know what to do because they don't have another man to call up and say, bro, or dad, or uncle. I don't know how to face this as a man, but I know you have. Can you help me? But men walk around secretly not knowing what to do. But that should stop right now. Let's go to the Lord. And if you are a man this morning and you feel so broken, you feel as if you are just wading through a sea of not even knowing what to do and you say, I need the Lord. 
You say, I just need somebody to pray for me. I know it's a, I know it's a big thing to come up and, and ask for prayer. I get it. I know. It's like, man, I don't want people to think this about me. I want people to think I have it together. But the truth is, you don't. And there's godly men in here will tell you, we don't either. But we could stand with you. If you are a man, and you say, you know what, Pastor? I just need to experience God's love. The first love you should experience is God's love. He is a good father that says, you are mine. And that comes from placing your faith and trust in Christ. If you're a man and the Lord is moving on your heart to respond in this moment of prayer, would you just move forward and come up front? I'd love to pray for you. Not to embarrass you, not to point anything out, just to pray for you. If you want that, just come down forward.